You know, for some reason, despite all the crazy things that happen in this chapter, the most interesting thing to me is that Kenjaku is fluent in Chinese. Before we hop in this review of chapter 167 of Jujutsu Kaisen, please do me a favor leave your own notes on the chapter in the comment section down below. Leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, make sure you hit that little notification bell so you don't miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Now, let's get into it. What's up guys, I got a pencil here, and here we are to be chapter 167 of Jujutsu Kaisen, which is known as Tokyo Number One Colony. Number seven. And honestly, now that I think about it, this naming convention means that we may actually get like our own little mini arcs in the other colonies. And there may be like a mini arc following Yuda, a mini arc following Akari, a mini arc following Panda. Which honestly, I'm not gonna lie to you. Loki get me a bit excited. No, I'm saying honestly, I just really want really want more Yuda. Like Akari is cool and all, but um Yuda. But regardless of that, enough of Okotsu. Let's hop into the chapter itself. So we get to see that, hey, Higuruma is about the business. That man popped up and said, hey, Okogane, it's new rule time, baby. We transferring these bad boys. And the point system just works. Now, thing is, I wonder if people will have to re-review the rule. I, I forget. Uh, No, no. Actually, I'm kind of shocked. I mean, Itadori pops up really, really quick right next to, like, right after this rule is added. Just like what happened all the way back then, but it doesn't say anything about the new rule. I guess because it's in the proximity of the ru new rule being made. So, I don't know. The main reason I'm asking that is because the last time a new rule was made, it was made by the other assassin person, the ancient sorcerer from all those years ago, not Higuruma. The Kogane popped up and just yelled it like, yo, what's good? Um, New rule added, blah, 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 other players' information. So, I mean, that's pretty pretty cool but i wonder like how many people are going to benefit from this rule how many people are going to be excited for how many people are not going to like it like what's the team set up for what's the strategy looking like what's what's what we doing what we what we trying to get into mainly because this rule honestly allows like a mo very different factor like people can start bartering for points like hey give me all your points or i'm taking your life or hey if you want to team up with me you need to barter with some point like like, by adding an exchange system to the point system, it almost adds, like, a extra currency. No. It adds more flexible currency to the game. Because, to be fair, points are currency in and of themselves. You can use them to buy rules, make new rules, stuff like that. But in terms of, like, a real-life tangible currency... <laughs> real-life home, I'm talking about Jujutsu Kaisen. But a pro probable tangible currency that two players can, like, barter with, now they can actually do that. Because before, it was just, you live, you die, I get your points, bada-bing, bada-boom. But now, it's like... You could live if you offer up the points you've done, which could set you back, and I could still kill you anyway. Or, but like, it's just it's interesting. I can't. I'm actually thinking that this rule will have more implications than what it just means for our main characters. So honestly, kind of excited. But then we get to see that after Kogane as the, <laughs> and I don't know. I I guess all the Koganes have something unique to them, because like, why does does it, did Itadori's... No, I don't think that's even Itadori's. Why does it have a mustache? <laughs> Why does it have little curls, bro? I mean, I like it. I like the Kogane as a mustache. But still, I don't know. It kind of caught me off guard when I first read it. But then we get to see Itadori. He's happy to get the rules up. And yeah, see, the thing is, it pops up. Huh. Yeah. So it does pop up. And yeah, Itadori doesn't have a mustache, so... <laughs> <laughs> I guess each Kogane is like slightly more unique. I mean, are their tails different? No, I think their tails are the same. Actually, no, Itadori's, Itadori's one has a tail that's bigger than the other one. So even their tails are different. Shout out how many different, yo, how many different Koganes are there and how much design modeling did Kenjaku have to do? Like, this one has a mustache, this one has a beard, this one has a goatee, this one actually has a trim beard. Like, I'm honestly wondering how much of this was just like randomly decided by the nature of the culling games, I suppose, and how much Kenjaku had to like personally sketch up choose draw all that like to be fair he's been playing the coloring games for like what a thousand years so he's had time to get creative with it but that's got to be tedious be redrawing different koganes and having them all pop up being manifested by curse energy that's kind of wild but then something I'm, I'm i'm not necessarily mixed on it well actually no i'm mixed on it because of the possibility of his return but i don't like it because obviously he's leaving higuruma isn't going to travel with itadori in fact he's just going off on his own and I, this is after he gives Itadori the one point, so they both keep their curse techniques, thusly. Because the main thing is, if you don't have any points after 19 days, you lose your curse technique. And that's no good for Yuji, even if it is just his curse energy. But in actuality, the main thing is that Higuruma's dipping, and it's because he, like, he doesn't feel like he couldn't do anything 
with Itadori. Like, he doesn't think that he'll ever be able to end up hating... No, he feels like he's going to end up hating himself more if he travels with Itadori because of how guilty he feels about killing those two people and of thus every other person he killed to get those 100 points. Like, he feels guilty for being a killer. And, like, Higuruma, that's cool and all, my boy. I get that. And I completely understand how this is perfectly in line with your character, and I get that you want to turn yourself in because of all the wrong you've done, but at the same time, my boy, you know how useful you could be? <laughs> like, you don't, you don't have to kill anybody. Just be support. You, like, you don't have to run. You, you want, I, and I know Itadori is a pure light, but he's about that action too. Like, he admitted himself he kills people. He'll do it. He doesn't want to, just like you don't want to, but as you did, he will. You could just you could just roll my boy a little bit longer. Like this isn't like that's the thing. Like you ever read something that makes absolutely perfect sense, but you just don't like it. <laughs> like I get why Hikaruma is being removed from the narrative at this point. It probably fits into his character. He performed his narrative role already, and it's not like he's dead, so he can completely come back in the late in the later narrative. That's something that can entirely happen. It's not like anything's guaranteed with him suddenly just disappearing. We're never gonna see the character again. However feel like it would have been a more interesting narrative if the story shifted from Itadori and Higuruma fighting to Itadori and Higuruma traveling and learning more about each other along the way and like hunting down Megami now that the rule has been established and maybe teaming up maybe a new trio obviously Nobara is still out of commission I believe I remember seeing somewhere on Instagram like Nobara has been out of commit well Nobara has been out of commission for like a year at this point specifically in manga time too not even like, relative to the narrative, a year hasn't passed in the narrative, but manga time, Nobara hasn't been seen on panel since, like, somewhere in, towards the late middle of the Jujutsu Kaisen. I was going to call it the Jujutsu Kaisen Warrior art. The Shibuya Incident art. Like, she hasn't been seen since then. And, of course, she got, you know, um, <laughs> one tap. But still, that would have been a cool new trio. Higuruma, Megami, and Itadori. That would have been a bomb trio can you imagine that especially like them learning how to use their powers in combination with each other like imagine it i know he would never want to do it but like imagine itadori wielding the executioner's sword while being like manipulated through shadows to help a megami that would have been so cool but he's removing himself from the narrative and i and i get i almost honestly get why mainly because higuruma's curse technique while it could be cool in someone else's hands i think it's more of a one-on-one -on -one thing like, I definitely straight up believe Higuruma had to run the gauntlet with however many people he had to kill. I don't think he just easily... Can, I don't think he can multi-trap people. Like, he can't do a group accusation. But even still, just Higuruma traveling with Itadori would have been so cool, even if he doesn't stay long, man. I get why he's gone. I get why he says later and just rolls out. But just like Itadori looks sad on that panel, I'm sad that he's gone. Because he was such a great character. Like, he shot up to being one of my favorites in a matter of, like, five chapters. That almost never happens. Like, I'll, I'll lament a character's potential if they pop up like this and then disappear. But not only am I to take his potential, it's just that he was a cool dude. I, I wish he stuck around a little bit longer. I'm kind of disappointed. <sighs> Once again, not criticizing Chapter for this. Not criticizing Gege for this. This is just... It, it, I get why I'd be like that when I'd be like that sometimes. I just don't like it. But then we move on to see... Back to the other side of the arc. If you forgot about Megami, and to be fair, I don't blame you. He hasn't sh shown up in like a month, maybe a month and a half, including the breaks. So he's kind of been gone for a minute. But we get to see that uh, this boy Megami, he's about that action. Because, well, actually, he was about that action. And that got him to pass on the test. And, of course, he's like, uh, so I didn't know that uh, there was a test going on right now. I look, he didn't study, if you don't mind me. So could you explain yourself before I explain your organs all over this that sounds ominous. Megami would never say that. But he would. Be, can you explain yourself before I explain your organs all the way across this hallway? Like, he would definitely be on that meta type mentality. But then we get to see that, honestly, there's... I'm leaping ahead of myself. But the thing is, this dude... I forget his name. <laughs> Already. I'm not gonna lie. But this dude is like, yo. Okay. Let me be real with you. I can tell that your shik shikigami are quite swole. You are quite swole. You are powerful. And honestly... I want to team up with you. That could be the move. That could be the play right here on some Higuruma and Itadori type beat. You know, something that could have happened, but we, obviously it can't happen because, you know, narrative. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. But then we get to see, the essentially, this guy's main goal is to almost circumvent the culling game because he sort of sees beyond the game itself. Like, he understands to some degree 
that Kenjaku is not putting, he's not saying exactly what he wants to say in the sense that when he asks Megami about the culling game, Megami gives the basic explanation. It's a ritual that takes the advantage of cursed energy, belonging to the players inside the barrier, and explodes it by making all people across Japan essentially non-human because of the exploding cursed energy from these powerful curse users clashing will affect the entire area around it and thus destabilize Japan. And this guy, apparently, he's like, hmm, okay. So you're friends with Kenjaku, huh? And interestingly is that Megami couldn't tell this guy was working with Kenjaku until that moment, but he still is willing to, un- like, I guess he may have been in collusion with Ken- Kenjaku, which is why he knows the whole point of the killing games as it is, but on top of that, he was colluding with Kenjaku, and he understands that Kenjaku's personality wouldn't have this clear-cut solution. Like, winning the games doesn't really mean anything. He sort of calls it a facade rather than anything, like, genuine. And he says that because there's got to be something else to this on the idea that the number of players, the difference in ability in players, and the barrier rule. Because if a thousand players were to be equally distributed in 10 colonies, there would be a hundred people in each colony. But with the players being sorcerers that are wildly different in strength, like you have your Satoru Gojos and you have your Miwas, like two beings that are, yes, by pure definition, both sorcerers, but one is obviously an entirely different class than the others. And that doesn't necessarily make for a good evolution or burst of cursed energy because there's just going to be people who stand above just in terms of raw skill and power that start bullying other people. For an example, we have the strongest players in terms of like Higuruma and Kashimo, and they're obviously just setting a high bar. They're going out slaughtering people left and right. And that means so many people have already been called within like probably at best the first couple days, and there's supposedly 19 days left. So that doesn't look good in terms of keeping a power balance. And that means out of one in ten, one in one thousand, there should at least be one like hyper strong player per each colony. And we know that to some degree that's true. Well, Panda isn't hyper strong, but you have Megami and Itadori, and let's just skip past Itadori and because we know who's really in the calling game, which is Sakuna. So Sakuna is a demon, obviously. Megami's full potential. He just drops Mahorga and dies and bada bing bada boom, Mahorga solos essentially. You have Yuta Okotsu, literally the king of cursed energy, bottomless amounts of it, and Rika strapped to the back. You have Hakari, who Gojo himself evaluated as a massive threat. You have Panda. Yeah, I already, I already, I already pooped on Panda, you know. But essentially, there are a lot of strong people that just got introduced. Not to talk of the people that have been chilling, accumulating points for the past couple of days, or even just been existing. So... Obviously, there's a disparity in raw power. That's something I necessarily didn't consider, honestly. Because for some reason, like, in my mind, when the whole stipulation of powerful ancient sorcerers, well, powerful ancient sorcerers came to mind. Like, that's what was established in my head. I thought everyone was going to be a top tier. I thought we were going to be running into, like, near Sakuna, near Gojo level threats left and right. And it was going to force our cast to explosively evolve. But as this dude points out, logically, one, that many people wouldn't exist. And two there are likely to be fodder because there's fodder in every field there's always going to be there's the major league baseball there's (laughs) there's major league baseball you're going to have your top tier baseball players and those who got in because they need to fill numbers same thing with any other sport same thing with any other job you have your low level workers and you have your ceos there's disparity there and that disparity especially if the strong are preying on the weak doesn't promote any growth for the strong just promotes kind of like feeding them I, I it doesn't necessarily make sense and that means that the coming games in the end game will actually reach a pure deadlock and that's something that honestly is kind of that's kind of implied in the culling games itself though that's not necessarily a big revelation when i read that i wasn't like oh my lord like when i thought it when i he introduced the whole idea of like there being strong players in minority and then feeding for some reason that one blew my mind away but the whole idea of oh it's going to be a deadlock. I'm like, yeah, obviously. Like, you, you can only have one winner, and they're going to be the strong people who won so far that are going to want to win still. So they're going to kind of have to fight. But I guess 
it'd be like that would it be like that and it seems like that Kenjaku just didn't care because the colony themselves as pointed out does just kind of throw you in like literally falling from the sky and thusly <laughs> if you can, if you have no technique that allows you to survive that or if you're not saved by anybody else you kind of just kind of just die because <laughs> you slam into the ground from high in the sky so that doesn't promote any cursed energy growth it just seems like I mean, I mean, kind of, like that's the thing. It kind of seems like cursed energy because, like, when those sorcerers die, it's not like their cursed energy vanished. They may even become vengeful spirits that'll roam the colonies, and that's extra cursed energy. But in terms of optimizing battles between cursed users, that's not necessarily the best way to do it. If anything, you just let them walk in and fight. But no, you just drop them from the heavens. So it's intriguing to see that Kenjaku. Well, no. It's likely that Kenjaku has some secondary motive that he has on top of the initial motive of just the Cullen Games itself. And speaking of Kenjaku, we get to see him meeting with Chinese people. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm not sure. Is, is that the Chinese government or something? I, I don't necessarily get it. Like, he was invited there, too. So that means something crazy. Like, these people may be like the Chinese sorcerer world or something like that. We don't necessarily know much about the sorcerer world outside of Japan. We just, we know it exists because that's what all the special grades are constantly out doing. They're constantly out exterminating in other areas. But in terms of organized, like jujutsu sorcery levels, like we didn't know much about that, but it seems like Kenjaku may be in there or something along those lines. I'm intrigued to see what he's doing, but then we get to see that, in order to counteract this massive hypothetical bomb that Kenjaku is going to drop, whether that be a large curse, whether that be a very, very, very powerful player, anything like that, what this dude has been doing to prepare is accumulating points and gathering powerful players. So that's why he's having this girl lure people back to him because, A, if they're strong, he can join up with them and that expands his team, gets them more prepared, and B, if they're fodder, they can die <laughs> and become his points. So... He's kind of in a win-win scenario. I ain't even gonna lie. Like he kind of he kind of playing the game right. He kind of playing the game right. But then we get then we get to see that Megami is like, okay, I'm in love with you real quick. This one behind me, I believe 100% equal rights. I'm trying to save my sister. You know what I'm saying? But she don't seem that strong to me. And it seems like this dude is like, yeah, not gonna lie. She kind of just fought her. Like, she kind of just straight up bait. Like, I use her because people are less suspecting towards women. If I went out there, you know, I kind of look, I kind of look a little key intimidating. You see the, you see the petals on my clothes? No one would want to come speak to me. And that's true. And then we get, to, and then we get to see Megumi pick up on the other part of the plan, which I mentioned the idea of just the moment she's run out of use, turn her into points. And bada bing, bada boom. You, you win. It's a win win. She either brings strong people or weak people. Strong people, team, weak people, points. She runs out of use because there are no more weak people or strong people. Points. In the end, everyone's happy except for her. She's dead. But then we get to see is that this dude's like, oh, what do you mean? I'm not like that. I'm not built like that. And obviously, that's a bone faced lie. But <laughs> we I know, interestingly, even she believes this. But I think she's smarter than that. Even I know she hasn't done much so far. But she seems to be smarter than that. So I wonder if her curse technique has something to do with like manipulating people maybe with through extended periods of time because her trust in him is seemingly deeply founded which is intriguing and we see that Nagabi after seeing that this is kind of not necessarily nonsense like he definitely understands what this dude is talking about but in terms of giving into their game he's like wait a minute let me just let me just let me just skip the pretenses let me level with you real quick let me know hey do you and your boys, your team, your men, if we combine all y'all points together, y'all got 100? And <laughs> he, well, I was going to call him Higuruma. I would never slander Higuruma's name with this guy's face. But the dude's like, I mean, if you, if you being, if I'm being honest with you, yeah, we got that easy 100 points. What you need? And <laughs> Regumi's like, I right, bet. Perfect. I'll join your team. <laughs> As soon as you give me all your points. And he does this. Oh, I, I love the summoning of the divine dog here. Oh, well, actually, no. It's not even a summoning. I think the divine dog. Yeah, the divine dog is out already in the chapter. But the way he, like, poses up with it. Like, pose, 
po- like, ooh, I love the pose he does, and that's why I chose it as the drawing. He, honestly, I haven't drawn Mega Man yet, and I don't draw him that often. But this pose of the Divine Dog, I had to do it. You know what I'm saying? That boy looking saucy. Then we get to see that negotiations have failed. And this dude, he comes out the clutch. He honestly looks a little bit like now Beto, if now Beto had like a ponytail and no shirt. And he comes in with these like interesting dark claws. So I wonder if that's like a curse technique. Or if he's just like solidifying cursed energy around his fingertips to claw into somebody. But we see regardless of whatever he does, he whiffs. And it's because this boy Mega Me, he must have read the Percy Jackson series or something. Because he's shadow traveling. <laughs> he straight up leaps away. And to be fair, like I thought all the way back when he did it. And those chapters when they're trying to go recruit Hikari. I thought this was a random thing. But then I remembered, wait, he does that during Chimera Shadow Garden, but could he always do that? Did he do that at any other time outside of Chimera Shadow Garden earlier in the series? And I just forgot. I need to go, because to be fair, I read Jujutsu Kaisen like a week, so I definitely need to go back and reread it. But in terms of like him shadow traveling before, I don't remember him doing it that often so when he kind of popped it out i kind of got confused but i'm happy to see it. it's a really cool ability especially when he uses it like this to like straight up teleport directly into someone's shadow and then drag them out really really cool then he does body bags and he like if we're being honest like i praise itadori for just being a superhuman monster in terms of strength speed stamina durability all that good stuff but if i'm being real Megumi ain't no slouch himself because he pops out the ground sends divine dog after the other dude and proceeds to like over the head lift this full-grown man and yeet him off the balcony with enough force to send him a few feet away only to pose pose photo shoot and just bam like he drops new way like a down special like out of nowhere new way just comes down with this dude that was trying to claw into him who still has the claws even when he's getting hit he he knocks down this dude with so much raw force from new way like that was a combo move that was so smooth but i always forget like yeah all of our characters are pretty superhumanly strong because like i'm not the smallest dude out there but so, but I'm not confident I could do that. Even if you gave me the leverage, I could not have launched that dude and then just casually gone into a downward motion to call my flying bird creature. And obviously, do it. He just manages to just boom body bag it. And notably, the girl is shocked to find that. Whoa! Wait a minute. He had that up this whole time. I did not even notice that. And notably, she's thinking that. Like, I, I, one thing if she had said it, but she's thinking that. Meaning she genuinely had no idea that Nui was just probably like perched on a tree tree somewhere waiting for him. And then we had to see that Megami's like, speaking of you, lady, never show your face to me again. No, when she, <laughs> Megami straight in with the run away and never return. And honestly, not going to lie. Like, I'm not saying the dude at the end of the chapter. I, 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 I should have learned his name. I'm not going to lie. I should have gone back. But I'm not saying the dude at the end of the chapter doesn't have any merit in what he's saying. But it kind of contradicts what Megami himself would say, right? Because the divine dog, we see after, he thre- after Megami threatens the girl to, like, run away and never return. The divine dog gets two <laughs> knives through its mouth. And we see that this dude seems... He views Megami as tepid, like, yo, honestly, you can't kill us since you want our points. However, if we're being real honest, we're skipping past the pretenses. Not even that. If you don't fight with the intent to kill, you'll regret it once you're dead. And this random eyeball drops and bada bing bada boom explodes, I guess? I don't know, it's a flashbang. I, cool. But I guess that's like, that's the sad catch-22 for Megami right now, because he's under, I think this is like, a few seconds in the past because we know parallel processes parallel time streams the kogane haven't popped up to inform anyone that the rule has functioned anyway like the rule has been added to the game didn't pop up to tell anybody so that means megami is banking as he says on the rule that the point system being transferred will be added however at the moment considering these guys are posing a threat to your life I mean, Megami, you may just have to hold that and go gather points in a more organic way. Or just gather some points right here, right now. Like, you you are in the presence of three sorcerers. If you body bag all of them, that's, I mean, that's 15 points right there, my boy. And didn't you say yourself, like, you're okay gathering points the traditional way? Like, if, if, you, ha- if you have to do it, you will. I think this is an area where you could have. So, I'm 
Undertaker have Mega Me like snap and go crazy and like some Mahorga and then do Chimera Shadow Garden and just go crazy. But in terms of him like letting loose, rocking out a little bit, I mean, I wouldn't mind it. You know, let him rock, let him rock. And even then, you could literally have him beat them within an inch of his life and have him about to go really finish them off properly. And then the Kogane pop up and be like, you can transfer points now. And Mega Me be like, oh, wait, I forgot. Whew. Whew. Let me, let, me, let me hold myself back there. My fault, OG. Give me your points. Run them right now. Like, I think that would be kind of cool to see Mega Me go off a little bit and then, like, be allowed to take the points away from him. That'd be cool. But, however, speaking of cool, this entire chapter was cool. As much as I, as, as much as I cry that Higuru was gone, his be, him being gone makes sense. It's perfectly fine. It's perfectly logical. The whole advent of this new situation with, or the idea, the advent of the new idea of the Culling Games, of there being a secondary or tertiary plan with it, that's very, very cool. I greatly appreciate that. I think the whole intrigue of Megami getting a battle again for the first time in a while, very, very cool. Excited to see this guy and what he can do with his cursed energy and stuff like that. I honestly wonder what the girl does. If I'm being completely honest, will she stay on her guy's side or will she switch over to Megami's side? Well, I don't know. I'm very intrigued. But honestly, the chapter is a solid nine out of ten. <laughs> See, I'm being mean. I'll give it a ten out of ten. Not, but like this is an enthusiastic ten out of ten. It's just that I can't find anything like wrong with it, like writing wise, art wise, anything. I can't find anything wrong with it. In fact, it has some really cool art in it. But in terms of just my my own personal emotions, man, I want to give it a nine. But out of respect, I'll give it the ten out of ten. But those are my thoughts. Please tell me your thoughts in the comment section down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is that guy with the pencil writing off.